my, my opening comment, uh, um, opening question is just, uh, you know, to describe for us the genesis of the process or the, the project. Sure. And maybe we can even back up a little bit because um, I can't remember if Fred told me or I read it in one of the reviews out there mm -hmm. about the project, but that, that he had met up with uh, another photographer in pursuing this idea um, <laughs> that wasn't the best match and then found Mary Beth was the perfect match. Right. And this spoke to a, a, a project that had really been in development for some time, at least in Fred's yeah. head, and that it wasn't uh, the product of serendipity. It was something that was really sort of thought through in advance. So I was wondering if you could tell us like how it began and sort of evolved finally to even to just get us to the beginning the project. Absolutely. Keep Mary Beth, do you want me to jump on this one? Great, yeah. I'll start there. So first off, hi, and I'll speak both to the people who are in the room and to the machine that represents <laughs> the people who aren't. Um, it's, it's really nice to be here. Um, thank you, Heather, for having us. Um, I have taught in CMS 20 years ago. I taught in this program. Um, I also taught at the Sloan School of Management. This is home world for me, and I'm absolutely thrilled to be back. Um, there's a lot of friends around the table, and I'm grateful, so thank you. Um, and I want to say that this is very much a joint Mary Beth and Fred project. And, and really, we, we really cooked it up together. I had been bothered for a long time um, by something I'd seen in Silicon Valley mythology. So some of you will know I'm a historian of Silicon Valley, very much focused on the myths that drive the valley and where they come from. And one of the deepest myths is that te technologists build systems that make people transparent. And that you know, through these systems, you can just see everyone and everyone's there. We can just, quote, connect everyone. Oh, I loathe that word. But... Um, you know, what was, what was becoming clear to me, though, was that the, the systems of connection that we were building did nothing to reveal the actual world on the ground in which we live. So I live in Mountain View, about two miles from Google's headquarters. I have a family. I raised a daughter there. Um, I have an, uh, a boy who lived with us for a period of time as well. And I know a very different kind of place. And so I wanted very much to see the valley. Now, seeing is really hard. And that's really Mary Beth's domain. So um, I was very, very lucky. I, I, a friend pointed me to a couple of different photographers. I actually had one out who will go unnamed, um, precisely because they lack all of the qualities that make Mary Beth and her work so special. <laughs> um, you know, uh, just plug your ears for a sec. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, Mary Beth will talk about her process, but, but it's, it, it's, I think that what Mary Beth has done in her other work, and she'll talk about her other work, is see people in places where those places have, for a variety of historical reasons, conspired to render those folks less visible. And Mary Beth has a technique for seeing, for working with her subjects, for making them visible in a classical idiom of portraiture of a kind usually reserved for honoring those folks who are already honored in society. And to do that work in Silicon Valley seemed especially, especially important. important. Now, as now, it turned, it turned out, that out that when we began doing that work, doing that work publishers, publishers told us that's not Silicon Valley. Valley. We'll come back to that story. <laughs> we'll come back to that. So, so I was lucky enough to get a grant to be able to invite Mary Beth out. Mary Beth out. You kind enough to, to trust me and come. Take it from here. Well, yes. Thank you so much for having having us. Mm -hmm. it's so good to be at the table and in the virtual world. I'm not exactly sure where we should where I should look. Should I not think about that? <laughs> should I just look at the humans here? Okay. Um, so thank you so much for having us. Um, uh, yeah, I got this call from out of the blue to go to Stanford and to to think about working in Silicon Valley. And my kids were pretty little. It was 2017, and I thought Silicon Valley. What? do I know about, so what could I offer Silicon Valley? What am I going to do in Silicon Valley? Mm -hmm. And my little son said, mom, can't you just do what you always do? Just walk around and talk to people. <laughs> and I thought, I suppose I could do that there. And I too was feeling really um, hemmed in by this mythology. I mean, Silicon Valley, was I going to go knock on Mark Zuckerberg's door? I mean, whose doors were, what was I going to be knocking on? So um, it, it, it took a minute to get used to the idea of going there and doing this work, but then it was just really about who is this community of human beings as an eco ecosystem, and how does this economy here, how do these, how do these corporations affect what life on the ground is like? And yeah. so that really just became my mo. It worked great, and and, and could you could you so Mary Beth and I at this point, it's it's. Um, I know you're so far away. We are we are so far away. <laughs> We, we have been working together really closely for a long time, so I, I, yeah, it'll just be. Will you say a little bit about where you come from and the work that you've done before, because that's so important to how you're able to see the valley. Well, I'd love to see something about that, and then I also want to say a little bit more about this invitation from Fred. <laughs> so I, my roots are in journalism, but I have in the last ten years done these long-term, in-depth 
projects in communities. So first in my hometown of Brockton, Mass, which is right down the road. And I've thought so much about being um, from Brockton and, and how growing up as the granddaughter of immigrants, I feel so connected to immigrants and newcomers and those layers of those, those layers of social change that happened with economies shifting. And those, that's, that's who I feel the most connected to. And that's where my work really started was in trying to say, you know, growing up in Brockton, which was a rich and beautiful and incredible experience with the most amazing people. That's not what the public perception is of a place like that. That's not what you read about in the globe. And yet the pride and the, um, the layers of love that I have for that place are so, are so deep. So um, my photography became a way to push against what wasn't being seen, Kept going all the way back to my, you know, my kind of earliest memories. Fred's invitation was a really interesting one because it was about someone who really did understand the place from a certain level, Fred. So Fred comes in as the perfect collaborator because what photographers are often doing is photographing life on the street, but not really understanding what they're seeing and the meaning of, of what they're seeing. So the best was that Fred had this real love for photography and real appreciation for it, but knew what the value was all about. So we had these, we got into this work mode where I was going out and talking to people and figuring out what life was like, and then bring it back to him and his wife, Annie. And we would sort of wrestle with the meaning of what I was seeing. And so together we birthed this work that we think really gets at that. But I, it would have been hard for either of us to do alone. And I think both of us were also coming professionally from worlds where there's a tradition that either a writer drives a project that is then illustrated by a photographer or a photographer drives a project and then a writer writes some stuff around it. And you know, one of the things that's been nice about working with you, and it's very different than trying to work with this other photographer before, was that we, it was totally collaborative all the way. Mary Beth taught me something new every single week. Um, and you were very patient with me as I um, mailed you academic books. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I read so, and underlined a lot of books. Yeah. And that, that was really powerful. And you know, we worked really so. so Stop me if you should. No, no, it's fine. I, I did want to ask though, but about the question you, yeah. you said, you know, you, your daughter's advice, I think, was, you know, just do what you always do walk around and talk to people. How did that fly in Silicon Valley, walking down the street, just being like, excuse me, I'm a photographer. I would like to talk to you. You know, how did you make the connections? You know why? It was amazing because um, everyone living there is aware of the myth. And aware of the discrepancy, discrepancy between the mythology on the outside and, the other side and what their life is like. So there, so there wasn't a person who I said, go ahead. We are aware and they're concerned. Well, con yeah, concerned and just, um, just conscious. It's like, a, it's, like a, it's like living inside Disney World, except mm -hmm. you're not... Um, you, yeah, yeah. Except you're you're invisible. You're not Mickey out there. You're behind the curtain making it all happen for Mickey, and your your uh, life is just not part of that story. Uh, I have another analogy that I want to bring in right here. So, so my first intellectual affection was the early American Puritans. Um, I was really in love with Puritan <laughs> of the 1620s back in the day. Um, somebody's got to do it. Anyways, um, I often used to wonder what would it be like if I could actually wander around in Plymouth, Massachusetts in 1620 and make pictures. And what would that be like? And I, I realized this is something that's been in our conversation for a long for time. time. The Silicon, Silicon Valley, Valley is the city on a hill over our time. It's held up as a kind of sparkling target for people around the world. This is how we ought to be. This is how we ought to live. But in fact, much like the original Plymouth, Massachusetts, it's a place where some people are depicted and understand themselves as saints and other people are depicted and understand themselves as less than human. And capturing that distinction was something that I think we really, really worked at together. Well, I don't think they understand themselves as oh, less than human. Oh, fair point. Yes, so yeah, sorry. But they know that they're not part of the main story. That's right even though they're working to make it happen. They're, they're, it, the main story is depending right. on their that's labor. Right. Yeah. But, okay, so you said the publisher said like, that's not Silicon Valley. They have no idea what you're talking about. Um, yeah. But and, it was crazy. But do you, so I'd like to hear more about that yep, story and just like shopping the book and the ups and downs of that yep. um, and the conversations you had. Mm -hmm. And then I'd also like to know like, is there some sense in which this uh, sparkling target that Silicon Valley, like, that that is tarnishing? 
that people are now maybe just because they're seeing Zuckerberg in Congress all the time. They're yeah. like realizing, oh, there's some kind of trouble here that we don't quite right. have a grasp on. Is that myth starting to, if not fall apart, but like adjust and change? So it's a two part question. I hope so. I'll start it and then yeah. 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 So so um I had thought the book would be an easy sell. I love photography. I have a large collection of photography books. At the time, I had an agent. I have a strong publishing record. I've written for different newspapers and magazines. I thought this is not going to be a problem. The agent didn't think it was going to be a problem. And so she started taking the project around. We coordinated the book. It looks pretty much like it looks now. Um, you know, available with a discount. <laughs> yeah, just saying. Um, but so, so the book was, was a, a really, I thought, a, a, a quite a beautiful project. She couldn't sell it. And everywhere she went, they would say, uh, sometimes they would say photography books don't sell that well, mutter, mutter, mutter. But the thing that we heard much more frequently was that's not Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. Silicon Valley is, and then it would be, you know, Zuckerberg, um, Tesla, Elon Musk, um, young white men, et cetera. And while we were working on the book, actually, tell you tell a little bit about National Geographic and your experience with them. Well, and yes, and we also, it wasn't just that we were showing it to money people who, did, who wanted something saleable. I mean, we showed it to a very pro internationally prominent sociologist, don't forget, who yeah, said, that's right, yes. this, isn't, what are, this isn't Silicon Valley. Yeah, we, he will go on there. These are yes. engineers. And so um, yeah. the National Geographic at the time was publishing an issue just about Silicon Valley. And they... Um, you know, I think Fred was, yeah, Fred's shaking his head. He was more irate about it. Than, I was very irate. Uh, they were into the whole, all the stuff, all of the tech development and the startups and the wacky ideas. Did you know that engineers are polyamorous? <laughs> Did you know that they form cuddle puddles? Uh, these, and these pictures, these pictures of these young, beautiful, all white, beautiful people, men and women, both piled up in like white clothes. It's like, looking at Rajneesh. It really was just wild. And so those were the bulk of the images. Back to you, Maria. Well, there were, some, there were some images that were more working class people who were trying to make it work. There were some, but I, you know, I was in journalism for a long time and I been friendly with and someone who was an editor there. And she wrote to me and said, um, we heard you have pictures of people in trailers. And they published one of my pictures because whoever the photographer was that they had invited out didn't didn't get into that level of life. And so the homelessness and the working poor and these are, you know, the working homeless um, was something that we were so focused on that we couldn't imagine that a National Ge Geographic photographer could spend a significant amount of time in Silicon Valley and not get at that. And that's so, the power of the myth. It's, it, this is the 1620 problem in Silicon right. Valley. You know, you go there and you, and you immediately see the saints you've been told to look for. And that's very powerful. But you, but you do, in the process of doing that, you unsee all the people around you. And the unseeing was something that I'd experienced just by living there and you know, going out to dinner and you know, seeing the way that people treat people. But, but you came in with a different view. And the other thing we really struggled to do, and you'll see it in the book, is really capture people at every level of the social stratum there, we tried, tried very hard to do the August Sander thing at least a little bit and, and try to capture everyone. So there are people there who are, you know, founders of companies and have fancy houses with pools. And there are folks like the woman who runs the taco truck on the cover. And it's the, it's the valley as it is. We sent it to we sent it to a magazine in California that said, well, this is an interesting view. I mean, we really got so much rejection. And then what happened was we got so much rejection and we said, OK, uh, Fred had a publisher in France, yep. and uh, the, the, the Europeans the could really see with their 30,000 book view what, what the American editors were seeing, and, and they published it. it. And then and after, after we got it published in France, we took it back to an editor at Yale who's been who been since with Chicago. And he, and he was, was able to. And, able and, to and the point that you're making, Heather, uh, is, is exactly right that something changed in America in those few yes, years. Yes, for sure. And the tech and labs really came into gear. The Europeans saw it well before we did, as they see many things in Silicon Valley before we do. Um, but they, you know, something changed in America. Tech Lash hit. Also, Black Lives Matter hit mm -hmm. in a way that suddenly it seemed like, oh, yeah, gosh, there are people of color in Silicon Valley. That seemed like a thing that editors could suddenly see. They, they really couldn't see that earlier. It was really fascinating. Like, no. Um, and so, so those cultural changes made it possible for editors to see it. And then the book, when the book actually came out, I'm thrilled to see on Amazon with all its wonderful metrics, bestseller of photography. <laughs> you know, like that was that was so satisfying, right? And so that didn't last forever. 
Yeah. <laughs> it lasted long enough to give me a thrill. <laughs> me too. The day yes. that it was the excerpt was in the New York Times. Yeah, that, that was yeah, a good that, day. That was a thrill also. Yes. Was a also, day. I want to take one note on that and give the New York Times a high five. The New York Times, not known for taking the point of view of the worker um, as a general thing, especially in the business section. Business section. And the thing, and this really goes back to the quality of Mary Beth's images. Those images, we had 15 images in a two page spread in the business section targeted at executives on the same day that Elon Musk posted SNL. Yeah, that's right. And I say, I give, the, I give the Times props for that. And so one of the things I'm proudest of in the project is thanks to your images, we were able to at least bring 15 images of the working class to the, to, to the leading, other than the Wall Street Journal, leading business section on the planet for executives. Yeah. They had to see them at least for those 10 minutes. And then maybe two or three images of there was a wealthy uh, widow but not wealthy mm -hmm. by the standards of that area, just wealthy <laughs> by, you know, my <laughs> standards, <laughs> yeah. a human, you know, yeah. um, and uh, I think just maybe holding a dog. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then there's that couple that has two children, but they right. can't afford to furnish their home. They have empty rooms and they, you know, yeah, and they're just... sitting in sort of yeah. desolate space, yeah. you know, and then everyone yeah. else is in a taco truck, the, the person in the, in the trailer. Yeah. Would it be helpful if we showed some images to folks? I would love for you to show some images. And then I had a question about those images, like the, the ones that I looked at, um, there is, I'm, I, I don't want to use the word repetitive in a pejorative yeah. way, but I see yeah. a framing of the like, people looking directly at the camera yeah. you know, in a, uh, yeah. is it a confrontational way, or is it just like, I am bearing witness, or I exist? And I'd yeah. like to get a sense of why okay. that pose okay. is the dominant one, one yep. as opposed to say, okay. yeah. seeing the taco truck person tacos. making tacos. Yep. So, yep. You know, yep. the, the, the person in action yep. that one might expect or... So this is a great question. And, and uh, Mary Beth, we'll, uh, we've talked a lot about this, but I think, have, are you ready to share? I've heard the question. Yep. Okay, great. There was one point I wanted to throw up before we go to the pictures though, which is one of the reasons that really, one of the things that really animated us um, Hope socio, socially and politically is that we see the country moving in the direction of Silicon Valley, the yes, economy right. of the country as a whole, and that communities as a whole are moving in this direction. So Silicon Valley ends up being this sort of beacon. If you want to go with this mode of capitalism that we're in, this is where we're going to end up, and it ends up not being good for people is what we are arguing. Right. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen. Okay, great. Thank you, Andrew. And I hope you'll answer Heather's question. I have my yeah, answers. I have, answers are a little different, which I think is also interesting. Um, and how do I get rid of this little bar, Andrew? You just grab it. Oops. Grab it and slide it away. Slide it. Slide it. Slide it. Slide it. Yeah. I don't have a cursor anymore. Oops. I think, sorry, I think I need help. The cursor's gone. <laughs> it's it's hiding. It's hiding. <laughs> just start cursing. Yeah. The cursor. cursor. Yeah. <laughs> Where did it go? I can see it. It keeps going right over the. Can I exit out? Yeah, sure. Well, we'll move it first. How about that? Yep. There we go. go. Okay, got it. There you go. Okay, thank you. I am screen sharing. Okay, great. Yep. Oops. Okay. So is that thing too annoying for words? Should I just leave it there? It's great. It's fine. Um, okay. So this is Teresa. This is the cover of the book. Uh, her daughter texted me today. Um, Teresa was working in a taco truck. I'll tell, I'll just tell a little bit about how I met each person. And then please, if anybody has a question, jump in, or if I'm talking too long, jump in. I will do, Fred I will, does that. And then I will also talk. talk about the aesthetic choices and the politics of those because they have some politics. Well, yeah. And I, yeah. you know, I yes, ma'am. Why did you choose? that photo uh, for the cover? Uh, yeah, great question. Uh, that's a good question. Can you show the French cover? We, uh, sure, I can. Uh, no, we can't, it's too We, I can show her the French cover really easily. We, this was the French cover. And I was actually working with an editor at the National Geographic doing a, or teaching a workshop when we were trying to figure out the, cover for the French book. And it was between these two. And he, this is a picture from the Apple headquarters. So it was this grand opening of the new Apple headquarters that 
big spaceship thing. Mm -hmm. And we were in this gorgeous marble space where all it's all been written about the marble and the aesthetics. And there was this woman who was just going back and forth, cleaning the glass, cleaning the glass. And so this shadow of her just felt like what we're trying to talk about, which is the underpinnings of the valley. The book came out, it did well in France, but the designer, who's a woman named Lucinda Hitchcock, who's at RISD and a dear friend of mine, was like, I don't know about this beige book anymore. She she had done this and she thinks, and, and there was the portraits are so much about this eye contact that we decided um, when we did this book to do eye contact, and this might be kind of interesting, I don't know. Um, we were trying to choose between um, Warren, the Warren, who is a venture capitalist and had done very well and had um, his business and his contribution to the narrative of the story was sort of about um, his feelings about where companies were going wrong ethically and how to grow big without going off the rails. Um, what other pictures did we think about, Fred? I think those, those were the two big, those are the two finalists. Those were the two. And so this picture was like, this feels like what one might expect from the valley. So they're all, this is, these are his employees. They bought this house. This is his house on the left. He was able to buy another property. This is a half a block from the famous garage where um, Hewlett Packard, Packard yeah, exactly. started in Palo Alto. They're all barefoot. They're on their laptops. And we thought that this actually, we, we needed this picture because we needed to show that we weren't avoiding this person. Mm -hmm but that we were, we were including this person from a different angle and a different, in a different perspective. Did you say those were his workers? Around? These are that's his employees. Because they read that's like his family. Right, but that's what yeah. these, but right, because he bought this house and so they're all lounging. Like, that's, all I would say that's like, a defining feature of elite work in Silicon Valley. Exactly. It's precisely the ability to connect your family. So I've spent a lot of time inside Facebook and not met up at Facebook. And they say, bring your whole self to work. You know, and they celebrate on the walls. There are posters for, you know, celebrate LGBTQ and trans and all, you know, they have, they have posters of Dolores Huerta, the famous farm worker, or farm worker organizer on their wall, even though they would never permit a union in the shop. Right. And so I would say that the creation of the faux community yeah. is a management strategy across the valley. You see it in play here. So this is where he lives. And then they bought this house. But I mean, he's a really lovely guy. He's a great, you know, he's a great guy, but he was able to create this work environment. Okay, so Teresa, um, I met her after a long day of shooting. I stopped um, in, I stopped in Palo Alto. There was a food truck and there was music. And I stopped to like eat dinner and relax. And when I, this is the, Sort of the art part of it is um, where my gut gets engaged and where my eye gets engaged and where I just have this instinct to, oh, to go, oh my God, oh God, oh God, oh God, oh God, I gotta go back to the camera bag. Camera bag. And, you know, and, you know like something, something so amazing about her and the light and the hall. And so, and so you know, I see some, some, some Spanish, Spanish and so back to the camera, I got my head. Yeah. Hello, and I explain, hey, I'm Mary Beth I'm doing a project in Silicon Valley, professor at Stanford, can I come in and make a portrait of you? So she turns and asks her boss, so the boss is okay. So now I'm climbing up into the food truck and in the back. So this is in the back of the food truck, super tight. And I only had three frames, like she had to get back to work, you know? Mm -hmm. So I took three frames. And I mean, I know why I love this picture is that her, she is so um, present and direct and uh, aware and with me and, um, pr you know, her, her, her presence is so solid. And I, you know, aesthetically, I love the gloves. I love the this on her neck. I love the way that she's framed in the black doorway and then all the other stuff is all around her. And we just really felt like this is the person who people aren't seeing when they're talking about the valley. Mm -hmm. no. Could have been any, it could have been a lot of people, but there was something so, she's not confrontational, but she's definitely like saying, to you. me, she's saying, Are you, do you see me or not, you know? Am I, wanna, I part of the record or not? I want to build on this because we, we thought about it a lot. And, you know, the, a couple of different pieces. We were, by the time the French book had gone through a process, we were still wrestling with this deep, you know, what was Silicon Valley depicting? And we, what part of the decision between those two was, do we try to make the book, do we try to get past that by saying, yes, you see, it's still Silicon Valley? Or do we confront it by saying, no, this is actually the Silicon Valley? Mary Beth pushed very hard for this image. And I think that was the right call. I mean, it's the right call in a variety of ways. First off, the class range in Silicon Valley is very different than anybody talks about. Mm -hmm. There's a much wider range. 
The second, ethnicity. I mean, this is, this is a woman of color in a world that is, in which all of the saints are depicted as white men. And so that's really important. This is a woman who does labor with her hands, which is again, something that is not emphasized in the Valley. And all of that is super visible in the image. The other piece that's been very important to me and gets to the aesthetic of very best work is that she's not just treated with a kind of respect. And I will say that this is one of the very rare portraits in the book where you did not get to know the person for a long time before, before. you shot, right? Mm -hmm. So you actually went in and shot right off the bat. Went very back unusual. Was after. Right. Um, one of the things that I love about the picture is that that idiom, that, that could have been painted you know, in the 16th century in Italy. The way that her body is held, you know, that's a, diff that's a posture and a portraiture and a look and a respect for the image that echoes down through art history to a very traditional but also very powerful place. And so the invocation of that place, however subtly, especially in this context, seemed important to me. What do you think? What do you think? I really like, I mean, like, my research is about the lingerie workers in New York City. Oh, and, really yeah. and I also took photographs, so ah. I struggle, you know, like just choosing my photos. So I was just wondering oh. because of that. Yeah. You got the long Thank answer. You. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Should we look at some more pictures? What should we yeah, do? Should we look at a pictures. few more? So, so this is Christopher. So to answer your question about the direct gaze, you know, I worked for decades. Um, feeling like a documentary photographer in, in, in which my role was to organize myself around the action so that I could, so that I could catch a moment that felt like an authentic moment of what was happening. Um, and then I became interested in portraiture in 2015. I started working on direct portraiture and just really enjoying this this relationship and this moment of the direct gaze. And, and then ha when you stop someone on the street, the artistic challenge, when you stop someone on the street and say, can I make a portrait of you? And they say, yes, then you're both kind of like, well, what do we do now? You know. And so how to solve that problem, how to solve it through the narrative, how to solve it through the relationship, how to solve it through the aesthetics of what's happening in that, in that, moment, in that moment in time. So I just kind of got into it. I hadn't really explored that direct thing before. And it felt like the right way for these people to be speaking visually for our, for our book. So this is Cristobal. So Cristobal is a, um, a security, we'll just show you a few pictures. He's a security guard at Facebook. Um, and I met him because when they were, the workers at Facebook were trying to form a reunion, I, I met him through some social, uh, through some organizing, labor organizing people. And when I met him, we met at a restaurant. We had this huge long interview. And when he brought me back to his house, I realized he, we met at the front of the house in Menlo Park. And then he brought me around to the back and I realized that he was living in his shit. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in, in this idea of, you know, and, and, and he's, he's a full-time employee, employee through, through a, through a, 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 a an agency, agency, a contractor. Uh, um, through a contractor, a contractor he's brought into Facebook, 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 you know, what Mary Beth found of the security guard would be true of the kitchen staff, the preschool teachers, and the, on down the line. Well, how does the economy, I mean, how far can these cobbled together sort of exactly. solutions go? Because if, if people, uh, the uber wealthy, mm -hmm. want to have this lifestyle, um, they, and they want to say have children, they need someone to teach their children. Exactly. And no one is going to drive eight or nine hours, you know, a day to teach their children. They can do better. Mm -hmm. So, you know? so, so how, so how does it become sustainable? Not to mention just like they need someone to take the garbage out. They need someone to pick it up from the curb. You know. Let me let me add, let me let me answer that question. Yeah. But, but in two in, in, in by breaking apart the word sustainable into two categories: mm -hmm. persistent and sustainable. Mm -hmm. um, the first question I think is how and why has this persisted for so long? Right. People do drive several hours each way. Um, and you know, the, 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 and I think the answer to why is twofold, at least. One is the economic differential is so extreme. Mm -hmm. So uh, across the mountains from, from Palo Alto is the second poorest county in America. The only one that's poor is one in Mississippi that's poor. You put that kind of poverty within driving distance of a place where in 2018, there were 74 billionaires in a two county region. You're gonna have people driving across the mountains. Okay, so just that difference is so enormous. 
And in terms of keeping that persistent, I think you keep the difference up. It's, it's perverse. But in fact, as long as you keep some people extraordinarily rich mm -hmm. and other people extraordinarily poor, you, it's, like, it's like creating a, a sucking vacuum. Those people need whatever money they can get. Yeah, These and there's always someone them. behind them. There's always someone behind them, exactly. Mm -hmm. So that system self-perpetuating. Mm -hmm. The other piece of that that's really important is ideology. As long yeah. as we keep as journalists and reporters and media people telling stories about heroic, creative, disembodied, mostly young, mostly white, mostly male workers, having genius ideas sprouting from their minds, you know, shooting off from the ground and, you know, rockets, you know, as long as we're doing that, then we're not going to break down what we're trying to do here, which is to say, no, we need to build media and do business for society as a whole, not just for, for leaders. Okay, that's one. How do we make it sustainable? That question, I think, is, is, a, is a very deep and important one. And I think that the first thing that we need to do is actually accept that business and technology are not there to make a profit. Profit is there to make a society and to make it better. And this is actually something that was widely understood in mid-century American business. We don't tend to think of this now. In my archival life, I spent a long time reading the first two years of the Ford Foundation reports, which are places where corporate leaders in 1951, 52 get together and try to figure out how to do corporate work for America. And the ethos then is one of, believe it or not, we at Chrysler really need to do what's good for the country. That's our job as businessmen. We need to do that. We need to not let salaries get out of hand. There's a settlement with unions. There's a sense that we are all in this together. And now it's a post-World War II moment. We need to reconstruct the notion that we are all in this together. How we do that is a long and complicated and hard story. Part of it, I think, involves government regulation. Part of it, I think, involves telling different kinds of stories. Our tiny piece of it is trying to say, here's the we that's in it. Because that we is not in the story. Please. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just going to say, though, that I think the definition of what's good for the country is still, in the century is still a racist and misogynist. Very fair. Very fair. So. And, Very and in fair. fact, I think unspeakable Republicans these days think they're doing what's good for the country, they're keeping black and brown people out and down. You know, I, so I, I, you know, that may be true that that was articulated. This is also a, a time of without question. Education. Yeah, without without question. No, I think that's I, I think that's an incredibly important point. I, I see it as a more mixed time than we remember. Um, I, I wouldn't deny segregation for a second, but I would also know also even know, in, in the places of the greatest the depression, city American army. army. There, there are, are efforts, efforts to desegregate and to integrate and to begin to build a different America, even in the places where the oppression is taking place. I'm trying to hold on to that. But we can go longer on this. Yeah, I know. I'm trying to hold on to that. What can I say? Maybe I should. I guess it doesn't feel like we're going to be tired of having a glory of freedom. Yeah, yeah. That's does not have to do also with what in the 1950s they were thinking of as the profit margin and what kind of profit margin needed to be maintained. I mean, isn't that what we're talking about too? That that's really gone off the deep end now with the uh, we think Fred. I, I do think I do. so. Um, yeah, I read it. I read it a little bit differently. I'm also. I also really want to just say that I heard the comment heard from me and my people. I really did hear that. that I don't know what to do. It is sinking in. Thank you. To hear that. Um, um, yeah, I, I think the profit margins have become grotesque. Um, I actually, I actually we've, we've kind of gotten it. I actually read this, read this cultural level that we've gotten trapped in, in a strange kind of mythological spiral, right? So one of the deepest stories in America is, comes from that founding moment when the, the British Puritans come and they say, look, God has decided who's going to heaven. It's predestination. God has decided who's going to heaven. Now, we can't know who that is, but chances are that if God loves you enough to send you to heaven, he's going to get you rich here on earth. And so gradually, wealth in 17th century America becomes an emblem of potential salvation. That idea permeates American society, it permeates it across the, the race lines. I mean, consider the Buffalo dollar, I don't know how deep we go into um, that kind of theology, but you know, it's, it's, it's across America, it's very powerful. Silicon Valley stands as an emblem of that idea, that in fact, God has decided that some people are saved and others are not. As long as you buy into that, as long as you buy into the idea that wealth is some form of salvation, the spiritual and the um, commercial are aligned in that deep way. It's very hard to make cases for other things, other ways of being. That's triply true in the post-World War II era as the institu institutions of sociability begin to crumble in a variety of different ways. Um, um, churches are declining, other spaces are declining, and it gets much harder to build the kind of society, and kind of do things together way across different lines um, that we desperately need. And so that theology, that kind of commercial theology is everywhere. That would be my riff on it, but I don't know. 
And I'll give you other books on that one too. I wonder if we could see if some more. Sure, we'll look at a few more pictures. Okay. Yeah. Because All right. More of a handle on yeah, let, let me run through. Okay. So here's Imelda, who um, I, you yeah. know, when I was there the first time, I, I was there for six weeks in 2017. I rented an Airbnb and I saw this woman coming out of a house, two women with mops and, and buckets. And uh, I went and spoke to them again in Spanish. And I just said, you know, I'm married with a man, photographer. I'm working on a project about life in Silicon Valley. Do you want to tell me? And uh, Melda said, yes. And she wrote down her number and I called her and um, we met. She, and again, she said, meet me at this gas station. She lives in Redwood City. Meet me at this gas station. And I met her at the gas station and she got in my car and she took me down this little street. And again, we didn't go into the house. We went into the trailer in the driveway where there were no, there was no running water. And we ended up going into the house where there were three generations of a family living. But I mean, so this became so common to me that I wasn't looking for desperation. It became so common that every time I entered a space looking for a working person, that this was the living situation. So we, we spent a lot of time together when I was there and um, uh, we made this portrait in her trailer. This is Ravi and Gutami. So we wanted to talk about um, the different, different you know, engineers coming from all over the world to Silicon Valley who, who don't, you know, who maybe are not part of the dominant narrative. And you know, they belong to this community of immigrants from India that's been growing there since the 1980s. Uh, and one and and you know and they talked about they want to have a family. They're both pharmaceutical engineers. They went to from um, India to the United States. They made many, many stops before they got to Silicon Valley. When they got there, they thought they thought we're not going to be able to raise a family here in this you know apartment for three thousand dollars a month. I'll pause for a fact. Yeah, forty uh, percent of the citizens of Silicon Valley were born in another country, mm-hmm. and um, fewer than fifty percent speak English as their first language in the home which is just a sort of interesting thing. It's sort of, it is a sort of an island in an interesting way. And you have a sense of the percentage of undocumented people? Because when I asked the question about sustainability, no, was, I mean, sustain, sustainable for whom? Yeah, but, fair point. But, yeah. but the, uh, does the system function, in, function however it does, yeah. in part because there are enough undocumented people that if the situation becomes untenable for them, they will either keep going. Yeah. Or they will leave and be replaced by more undocumented yes. people. Is that a key part of the dynamic? Is that it's a great question. I do not have stats on, on undocumented people. I do have stats on poverty. The poverty is robust. I mean, 14% of women, pregnant women, do not have um, what would constitute um, sufficient food. Um, 14%, think about the pregnant women not having enough food. Um, I can go to, on down the line, but this it's not helpful. I do think the your, your point, the very best point about Persistent, the, the persistent availability of impoverished workers is right on point. Right. So I was trying, I did, I did start to make these kinds of, Fred started calling them the interstitial pitch pictures. <laughs> but, why, use, why use one syllable? We can use four, right? You know, I started to just sort of grasp at these scenes that were kind of, that I was seeing every day as I was driving up and down the highway. And there was this funny kind of Judeo-Christian pushback from the community against what the new kind of sacred temples had become. And I just, uh uh-oh, what's happening? I don't know, you're still, I'm still. It makes it look like you're not on Zoom. The screen now? The screen is, it's a different screen. Yeah, it's not moving. But my. Oh, this is a different, oh, I see, yeah. Now you're back. Yeah, I can can zoom in. Zoom may have crashed. Yeah, looks like. Fred, you're still on. I'm still on, but I don't have. Pictures to show. Fred, maybe you yeah. Be able to re- yeah. Great, it's yeah. interesting because you were basically telling the Bavarian story, mm-hmm. but he tells the story really differently. Mm-hmm. He tells the Indian really differently, right? Like the the actual meaning for the quest to salvation falls out. That's the Iron Cage. So I'm interested right. in your twist on it. Like right. So I, yeah. So so I think that the the the. Yeah, for Weber, the, the 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 meaning of the search, the religious, the it's specific. Not. We're it's, just doing. We're just doing. The just doing that, and I, I think that's fair. I think that's totally fair in this case. I do think that Silicon Valley is a much more religious place than anyone thinks. Mm-hmm. It's really actually interesting. It's settled by Catholics, actually. Um, yeah, and it's still quite Catholic. Um, it's but it's it's actually religiously quite diverse. I live on a street that's um, near a very main drag, and the main drag um, was designed when the area was built to have a line of churches, and they're pretty full. 
um, which is also peculiar. Um, There's also a very strong, very conservative evangelical. So that's the California. California evangelical, <laughs> evangelical style, right? So, so I do think that's I do think that's there. But you're absolutely right. I I think that um, the fantasy of glittering heavenly wealth permeates the valley, and you almost can't separate the glitter and the the heavenliness from its religious roots, if you know the religious roots. If you don't know that it's just like getting rich. Yeah, and the potential, yeah, go for it. You can always make it, you're gonna make it. Yeah, right. If you want fail fast, fail often. <laughs> <laughs> it only works if you have deep pockets. No, I Oops. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, uh, Okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> Woo. All right. Okay. All right. So this, you know, these things that keep that keep showing up. This is the Facebook bus. So there are these unmarked blackout windowed buses that the companies send around to get their employees. So the employees, so we started talking a lot, Fred and I started talking a lot about community health and what does community health mean? So when not only are you buying into if you're if you're wealthy, can you buy into this buy yourself a bubble? But the employees are floating in these worlds that are not interacting. So if you're a Facebook employee, you're not standing at the bus stop with everybody else on Market Street in San Francisco. The bus is coming for you and you can get your hair cut and you can get your teeth clean. All kinds of things happen on the campus. The bus right? is coming to a public bus stop yeah. because the company has made an arrangement with the state so that special, special buses can right. stop there at a, what is essentially a public resource. And this pattern of... of taking private advantage of public resources permeates the valley of much of American life. So, you know, Chet, um, Fred talks a lot about my upbringing in Brockton, Mass. But I mean, it's, it's you, my feeling and my bones is we are enriched by being in close proximity with one another all the time, whether it's in the market, in schools, at the bus stop. And what these companies are doing is taking the valley and really stratifying it. And so people are not interacting. So they don't even, are, they're not even seeing the people who are working to support the companies that, they, that they're working for. So this is Richard, one of my all time favorite people. Um, I had learned through uh, some research that the AFL-CIO was trying to organize at Tesla and that the meetings were happening at a site of, um, near the building. And I got myself to do one of those meetings and was able to, you know, be present. And I was introduced by the person who was doing the presentation, which is about workplace safety and trying to tell Tesla workers, you know, you've got rights um, and, and how to identify abuses and how to speak up. And so I'm sitting at the table and I'm like, oh my God, look at Richard. You know, I just like have that, that's when my heart and everything is just like, oh God, I hope he lets me photograph him, you know? <laughs> and I talked to him recently and he said, remember how you were we really hoping that I would let you remember remember how you were praying that I'd say 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 that I'd and he had lived his life as an American auto worker and he, he was making six figures when that plant shut down. Um, and then Tesla comes in and he ends up on the floor making something like 40, Yeah, $18 an hour, 40 something, $40,000 a year. And his, and, and he ended up being, he's in the news, you can look him up because he ended up being, he started organizing. He started working with the AFL-CIO and started to, talk to workers about their rights. And he was saying, you know, I saw guys sleeping in their vans, working 18 hour shifts, blowing out their shoulders, sleeping in the van, taking a shower in the locker room and coming back and do it again. He started to organize, he gets fired. So Elon Musk was found in contempt. I mean, it, it was found to be an illegal firing that, um, that violated the law about organizing being legal. And Elon uh, appealed it something like three times. He was ordered to pay him back pay and reinstate his job. And as of now, Richard is still not working. And what he said to me on the phone was, my back pay is like a penny to Tesla. He's not getting, he keeps appealing to send the message in Richard's view, not to organize, to, to. Should I build on this? Yeah, I, yeah. I think, I think the, the image reveals an economic pattern that is permeating America right now. And I, and I think this is part of the work, right? I, Companies like Tesla and others and that run those buses 
are trying to kind of build um, an economic world in which both, quote, thinking workers live above and cut off from anyone who works with their bodies. And in, in, in the universities, this is told to us as the triumph of post-industrialism, the triumph of network society, the triumph of the space of flows and the Manuel Castells idiom. And um, in, in point of fact, what happens is that while they're constructing this illusion of kind of the cloud floating safely and naturally above the world, they're pushing down super hard on workers and in a very embodied, very driven, very directed way that takes full advantage of poverty, racial difference, all of the social, social schisms that actually are American. And, and it's, 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 it's really, really nasty. And surfacing that, surfacing the bodies of people seem really important to us. I mean, we talked a lot about that. We talked a lot about getting bodies back in the mix because they're not in the conversation. Well, I mean, and that's all, that's all I have. Is the people. You, know what I mean? you know what I mean? And that's, what, that's all I have is the conversations and the interactions with the actual people. You know, I'm not doing the research. Um, so, so that's, that's all I bring yeah, is, yeah. The, is the bodies. You know, right. it wasn't like I had a choice. Right, right, right. Um, uh, Abraham and Brenda live in a trailer outside Stanford's campus. Um, and this is someone who had a drywalling business that he lost in 2008 and was in the crash and then was trying to keep things going. And they were living in people's sheds and then uh, the authorities would come and the shed would get torn down. They'd go to another friend's house. They'd go to another friend's house. So they took their savings and they bought this trailer and they lit. And so when you go to Stanford, you know, that Palm Drive, that incredible, well, perpendicular to that Palm Drive and all of the beautiful landscape is an entire row of trailers, which most of which house working people. I learned that there was a woman who worked in the Stanford bookstore who lived in one of those, but I was never able to find her. That was something. But I did meet Abraham and Brenda. And, and what happens with Stanford is that when there's an important football game, like the homecoming game, they order all the trailers to clear out. And so Abraham and Brenda, you know, go over to Half Moon Bay or do something beautiful uh, with the day. But can you imagine? So this image control, right, Fred? Yeah. I mean, it's so, almost so amazing that I, I'm thinking, is this real? Even as I'm saying it to you now. But they tolerate it because they have to for the system to function, except when there's an image crisis. Well, I, or well, we know that they do. I, I don't know if I can say that for sure, but I know that on uh, day of an important game, they are, they have been ordered to leave. So, I don't know how they do that though, because that's 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 road. Right. Right. So, so there's actually a real issue about this right now. I live in Mountain View and in Mountain View, the city has outlawed trailers on all city sponsored roads. All city roads are now, they spent a million dollars putting up signs saying, you know, no, tra no parking of vehicles longer than X dimension here. It's, this is Victor. It's, it's, this is Mountain View. It's completely shameful. This is Mountain. Victor lives in one of these trailers here. So those are all gone now by Rainsville Park. Not done yet. Sorry. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, so no, the except that there are two exceptions to this rule in Mountain View and in, and in Palo Alto, same office. Yeah. And that is for state-owned roads. State -owned roads. roads. You can still park a trailer on state-owned roads. So there's El Camino Real, which runs the full length of the peninsula, and that is a state-owned road, and that's where all of these ones outside Stanford are parked. They're all on El Camino Real. The other exception is by city, there are still a couple designated spots where people are fighting to stay. And this road near Rankstore Park is one of them. And one of the reasons they're allowed to stay there is because it's the Mexican neighborhood. Right. So now you'll be thrilled to know that Mountain View is now, now um, creating, uh, created an advertising campaign, Mountain View, an, exclusive community, an inclusive community, <laughs> an inclusive community. Um, and it says absolutely nothing about class, focuses exclusively on ethnic diversity, which allows them to focus exclusively on international tech workers. Wow. It's actually fascinating. It's completely fascinating. So this remains kind of invisibilized. And, and this is very much under threat. I mean, these, may, these will go away as soon as the lawsuits work their way through the, the system. The last thing I kind of want to bring up is this, the, Fred, yeah, Fred does a lot of work on invisibility of um, pollution and how toxic, um, what are the numbers? Yeah, so pause for a second. Yeah. Silicon Valley is actually the, the most polluted region in America, though we don't talk about this. Um, the uh, Santa Clara County, one of the two counties that make up the valley, has the single highest density of Superfund sites in America, worse than Love Canal. Um, Superfund sites are sites left behind, polluted sites left behind by corporations where the corporation goes bankrupt or is otherwise unable to clean it up and the, the responsibility falls to the government. Those sites are ranked in the order of desperate need for repair. Superfund sites are the most desperately in need of repair. So this is like Love Canal. 
Um, one of the first things you do when you buy a house in Silicon Valley is you get a super fun site map online to make sure that you aren't near a pollution plume. Um, and you really try to figure that out. We have houses in Mountain View, you're gonna, Mary Beth will talk about this in a second, that are built five feet off the ground. And they're advertised as having, you, know, you have one right there, yeah. This um, is Sunnyvale, the same thing. Same yeah. idea, yeah. So these houses are advertised in, in, in the Mountain View cases having above ground basements. This is a benefit to you. You don't have to go below the ground to store your stuff. Why? Well, they're built on top of things called TCE plumes. TCE is industrial solvent that flows through the ground and it off gases and it's toxic um, in a certain density as it rises up. Um, and apparently the toxicity falls below the government mandated toxicity level for humans to live with it at three feet off the ground. So your basement is five feet. And this is, but this is a really expensive neighborhood. Yeah, that's true. I mean, the house is a little teeny bungalow. It's a million, two million dollars. This is what it looks like with the, re the, re the, re the remediation. You know, and you know, and this is Mark, Mark whose mother, mother worked in, in technology in the seventies and eighties before yeah. the regulations are in place yeah. now uh, were, were were there, and she, she was working fusing. You know, when you go to the grocery store and beep, you beep the laser, she was fusing the glass to create that laser, and she was working with lead. She was working with molten lead, and she had a miscarriage, and then she had had Mark who had severe disabilities, and then she was driving around. The valley and heard an ad um, for a law office on the car radio that said, "Were you working in technology during these years to have a baby that meets these um, that meets this description?" She was able to um, take it through the courts, but this is not um, uncommon no. for kids yeah. to be born with birth defects. Yes, yeah. should we? Yeah, why don't so we? Like, we should open up to, to Q and A. And should I stop screen sharing? Uh, I'll, leave it. Oh. I'll leave it. I don't know. It's so, yeah. just the option of like going back to images would be great. Um, I'm happy either way, but, but we'd definitely like to answer questions. Yeah, yeah, whatever's on folks' minds. I've been asking questions, but I'm just going to start with one that might be just off, which is uh, your one of your, your key terms for thinking this through is, is mythology, thinking about myths of uh, perfect places. Um, but as I was looking through the book, reading Kansas and all this kind of stuff. I was thinking more about the concept of utopia. Mm -hmm. And I started getting, I started falling right into Margaret Atwood, which happens to me often. Yes, um, and thinking about the kinds of systems that she describes. And um, I thought of this line that is in Hammock's Tale and also in the series, better never means better for everyone and always means worse for some. And that's mm -hmm. her, the way that she conceptualized she has a word use utopia, mm -hmm. which fuses utopia and dystopia. It's mm -hmm. not the most elegant word, but her point is that any utopia is a dystopia, and any dystopia is a utopia. Because as there's always someone who thinks that the system um, is amazing. It works, it really, works really well for someone, and it's a perfect, perfect world. And Handmaid's Tale is a dystopia, 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 dystopia to most, most readers, readers, but there, but there are characters in there. Yeah. Yeah. This is our new world. I mean, people can be. Uh, uh, it, it, you know, capital punishment kicks in when, when people have an abortion or perform an abortion. This is a perfect world, yeah. which of course we're seeing, you know, right? Something we're thinking about in our imperfect right. world. So I'm just wondering to what extent the concept of utopia or utopia, the failed utopia, uh, comes into play. And also, I mean, her world, it's very, in her fictional worlds, there's intentionality. People are building structures right. that make everything better for them, that they know makes it worse for others. But but that's okay, because they're better is the best, the most important better, right? Yeah. Um, and so there's an intentionality in say, well, where do we let the tra trailers park? Right. You know, what's the zoning issue here? How do we, you know, you know, how, so, how do we make sure our workers are no other ones but they can walk and I wouldn't have believed in the intentionality argument until my wife and I went to a city council meeting about the trailers. Mm -hmm. It started at 6 p.m. and there were all these, remember this, all these working class families there, many Mexican Americans, some of whom didn't speak English, all of them had kids, tons of kids, families, all there to protest the imminent pushing away of the, of the trailers. And the meeting went on and celebrated the softball team and the high school and the new lawn and the track field. The time goes on. The parents start leaving to go put the kids to bed. Finally, 11.30 p.m., 
we take up the issue of trailers and almost all the families are gone. Yeah. And it was just incredibly clear at that moment to me that, that actually our city council accident. worked very clearly for the, the, the tech firms and the developers. And I, mm -hmm. I had not fully grokked that. Now, I will confess, right? So I, um, this is my, my period of confession. I, one of the reasons I wanted to do this work, one of the reasons I focus so much on mythology and my academic work is, you know, I, I, I'm disappointed. I fell in love as a 23 year old with the fantasy of a community of saints living in a brand new land, the Puritans offer. I fell in love with that fantasy. I think it's a fantasy that animates of early America for you know, rich white men. Um, and I was in that category for sure of people who, for whom this was built to work. And I was excruciatingly pained by the fact that it wasn't working, not only for people who didn't look like me, but for everybody, including. And, and I think the, the thing that we inhabit now, the thing that gets me going in Silicon Valley is that this place is being offered as a utopia in the stories that we tell about what America ought to become. But it is precisely a dystopia in the deepest possible way. And it works for ever narrower slices of people. And there are absolutely people that, when you're talking about how like, there are people who say, this is the perfect world for me and I'm building it better for me. I know those people, absolutely. And for those people, these are not fully people on the screen, right? And, and so, as a sort of disappointed former member of that world, I want to figure out how to make the world better in a different way. That's, I guess, my motivation. It pains me to know that, but I think that's where I'm at. Can I ask a question to go on? Yeah, sure. Okay. I guess I wonder, like, do you need pain in order to empathize in the sense of, because to me, that's what strikes me as the problem. Like, you know, we're expecting empathy through even the most richest of billionaires stuck in the bubble should be able to see people as people without feeling the pain. Yeah, it's great. Just because yeah. that's ethically right. Yeah, <laughs> you right. know, it's like, I don't need to yeah. feel, I, sometimes in fact, I shouldn't have to pretend empathy. Right, sure. Which is the problem of performative right. activism. Right, sure. So so I have, I have lots of thoughts on this. Um, my, first book was a book, right. my first book was a book about traumatized combat vets mm -hmm. um, who were able to do what they did in, in combat in Vietnam because they've been trained not to see the enemy as human beings. And they struggled with that. And I've thought for a long, long time about this problem. I think there are um, systems and incentives that reward folks for not seeing other folks. It's very hard to break through that. Um, if, so I'll give you an example from Facebook. Facebook surrounds, surrounds its workers on the, on the main floor with, um, people, with pictures of people of color of all kinds, people of all diverse orientations, everything from one square to others. And you might think if you were a Facebook worker that you are acting, as you do your Facebook work, acting empathetically with these, this array of um, imagined others. But in point of fact, you are mining their world such, so that it can be mapped and monetized in a surveillance capitalist regime. And so, so but are you going to recognize regular folks from that space? I don't know. All your incentives are the same. I'm already on Polyon. What did you call it? What capitalist regime? Surveillance capitalism. Well, that's the deal. I mean, doesn't that seem, I always say, Fred, well, shouldn't the billionaires just give up some of the money and, and invest it back in the community? Like, it doesn't seem that hard. All the money is being siphoned off, sequestered off at the top. And then somebody like Jeff Bezos gets props for sending money to wherever he sends it. But I mean, so we're, we're ending here on Constance, who's a teacher at Facebook, and she was driving three hours in. Oh, no, sorry. She's a teacher in Menlo Park, in Menlo yeah, Park at a job. private school. <laughs> and she was driving three hours into town to work and, or two hours in and two hours back. And she had these little girls and they'd get home and they'd be starving and she wouldn't be able to cook for them. She wasn't able to take a class. So Facebook builds a teacher housing. And I think they dedicated something like a billion dollars to this pilot program for teacher housing, which is right near the campus. Now, there are other issues because there are people in the neighborhood who feel that Facebook is really pushed out. It's in a predominantly black community. And so, you know, uh, the picture of Geraldine and the church, you know, so, you know so, so there are other issues that way, but they build this housing and Constance is able now to live there. She can afford it. The rent is set at a percentage of her salary. She takes her 10 minutes to get to work and 10 minutes back. She can, she can quantify the ways in which her life have, has improved 
because of the time spent with her kids and, and being able to take a class. So it seems like more of this could work if the companies took that money and invested it back in the communities and felt what, what Fred, you were talking about, about the forefront, you know, this, like, this, this note and, and exactly as you're saying, just ethically speaking, should a corporation that relies on the bodies of that, uh, that inhabit this community be responsible to the community health overall? And why? Or are we just going to the bottom line? And I want to tie together, very much, I am very much of one mind on this. I want to tie together your question with, with Heather's comment. Um, one of the things that people do to build utopias for themselves that exclude others is they, they create visual regimes. They create mm -hmm. ways of literally seeing one another and they structure those modes of seeing. I've, I've written about this in other contexts, mostly post-combat contexts, about how the veterans I studied were, were literally taught to see Vietnamese people in a very particular way that would allow them to assault them. And very deliberate, very explicit, very much part of training in the period. And one of the things that I think we collectively, our generation has seen is a marketing push from Silicon Valley, led primarily by Apple, but other firms as well, to structure how we see our devices, how we see the tech world, how we do and do not see the workers that go into it. By way of example, um, when I was brought my first Apple Mac by the Stanford people who like the computer from work, the Stanford IT guy takes my hand, which is not something that I generally do in this world, but he takes my hand and he says, this is a new Mac. And he rubs my hand on the Mac. <laughs> like that, that, his, that his touch life should be central, centered on the Mac is the product of a regime of the structuring of our sensations such that he's, I know it's, you get a little willies, right? Yeah, right, yeah. This is a true story. The, we do not see all of the people who build that, all the people who take it down, the villages in which these things are burned to separate the elements so that they can be sold in China, right. pollution, none of that. What we see is the visual construction of sleekness, smoothness. That's what we we're trying to capture in that first cover, you know, was, was the, so we don't see the shadows. The shadows right. People are shadows on this very sleek world. It was too subtle. We needed something and said no. You know, a very dear friend of mine. Who, the question the back oh, I'm sorry. No, I'm well, I just want to say a dear friend of mine who's a young photographer uh, in Atlanta, she's from Montgomery, Alabama, a young black woman, um, is being approached by, I won't say which corporation right now, to mm -hmm. come and do advertising work for them because she's got this young black millennial vibe going in her pictures and that's what she cares about she photographs the south she photographs her community and they're trying to mine that aesthetic for their ad campaigns and i want her because she i want her to have that income but i'm like oh you're gonna be careful they're using your vibe to pretend they're something and is it that, that's quite questionably not what they are i wonder if you guys want to say like factory work in the sense that, like, for example, I see that, you know, it's one strategy to bring the teachers near the schools and one strategy to decrease the, late, the salary of factory workers by half, right? In the sense of, like, uh, uh, my, my, my guess would be that factory, factory work is kind of automatable, but the fair work that the fair work is here is not, and not even. Right, right. There's a lot of backlash, I was trying to unpack that a little bit. So I, I think that actually all workers are seen as unavailable in Silicon Valley, actually. I think it's, it, and it's generally depicted as a question of time. Um, we're coming for you, it's just a matter of time. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I, I really do think that. And I, I, so I've been a, I've been a, um, a jurist for um, large grants for AI projects, some of which are about learning. And um, some of the ones that scare me the most are um, projects that are about using AI to model and argue in the view of the presenters, improve the lives of, for example, autistic children. Um, deeply disturbing stuff. So I, I think that's, I think everybody's got it. I think that um, what goes on in the Valley is this, this story about some people are so special that we have to pay them a lot. And some people are so ordinary that mm -hmm. we don't. And the specialness is constructed through a series. For example, if you join Google, right, your specialness is through taking a very serious series of tests to find out whether you're a Googler or you're Googling, right? You do the tests. The tests definitely solicit certain kinds of practices and whether certain kinds of knowledge, fair enough, but they also demand certain kinds of performance. My favorite example of that scheme is with um, startups. Venture capitalists 
routinely seek out, we'll talk about this, they don't seek out ideas, though that's a good starting point, they seek out people. They want people who are going to be the kind of people who, who will persevere and help their companies pivot as products fail. What's day, what, so the, the ideas pivot, but the, the people stay. Now, what do those people look like? Where have they gone to school? When I first talked to friends at Google, it was about 10 years ago. I said, well, so where do you get your, oh, we have five schools. MIT, Carnegie Mellon, Stanford, we have Harvard, Princeton, and all that list. Like, okay, that's a pretty selection. So what we've got to do to get to the place where we can cut salaries, We've got to imagine that all of these species of work are in essence about helping people have better lives. It's all work. And it's no specialer to write AI code than it is to make a beautiful lunch, to teach a beautiful class. And the only way you get away with paying a teacher 50,000 and a coder half a million is by pretending that her work is less complex, less important, um, and less valuable. And that's, that's an ideological project that has a visual component that we're trying to challenge. It's kind of building on that. Go for it. So I guess my question is that notion of sort of attracting top talent uh -huh. is not unique just to capitalist Silicon Valley, isn't it? It's also the American dream in a sense of like, we want the ideal immigrant. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The, the immigrant who's an international student who goes to MIT but not the worker in, you know, and then you can see it through Harvard and MIT in cursing through the means right. during what happened you know, during the pandemic and yeah. who was being, you know, protected. Right. right. Um, so I guess I'm trying to see if there are other institutions you can link this to that are outside of Silicon Valley. Sure. Well, in, 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 Indian, in, in the Institute of Technology, you know, you know I, I see it. You're incredible. Yeah. Top Talk Consulting. I mean, there's a whole series of firms from uh, in different countries that are doing this. It is kind of a global thing. But the piece I want to distinguish is the distinction between the search for particular skills and search for particular kinds of people. So Canada has a very rigorous application process. I've been exploring it right now. Um, for, you know, if you want to escape Trump land, you, you go north. I, I've discovered that, in fact, they'll take older professors if, you're, if they're willing Speaking to teach you. Speaking of Margaret Atwood. You know, if, exactly, if they're willing to teach you Newfoundland. And I am. Just anyone here there in Newfoundland? I'm right there. Yeah, here we go, right? Okay. So, so, so they have a point system. It's all about skills. And they're very thoughtful about how they do that. I would say that in our country, we're very sloppy about how we do any of that because we're looking for a certain kind of person. Pedigree. Pet, not just pedigree, but also this kind of entrepreneurial person who fits within the unspoken the foundational mythology of the nation. That, you know, this is the kind of person who's going to innovate, bring us new things. They are special. They are pre-selected. And their pre-selection, their pre-coordination, their predestination, you know, and they're already that kind of person in their home country. We need them here because this is the place the predestined to come. So I think there's a kind of really robust mythology in play there. It's not about skills. We have a lot of difficulty having conversations about different skills and different kinds of workers we want in the country because we're so boxed in by this unspoken mythology. Let me say one other thing about unspoken. I'm doing a lot of work right now in the 70s and 80s on religious approaches to media technology in that period. We here at MIT may not think this way, but Calvinism is very much alive in the United States. You know, in, in, in the late, in the early 80s, one survey showed that 33% of Americans believed in the rapture. Take that in for a minute, the rapture. God is going to come down, pick us up, those who've been selected, and take them to heaven and leave the rest behind. One, three out of 10 Americans believe this. So, so again, we may imagine that we're working in a world of ethical rationality. And certainly those of us who teach at Harvard or wherever say, you know, rational choice, it's how people work. Well, uh, no, it's not. And we live in a world suffused with religion, suffused with pathology, far more than we know or address. And we need, need to, and I'm done with you now. Thank you. <laughs> yes. I just want to say that, uh, you know, that that idea of disparate valuation of different kinds of academic work is very much a have have here. Right, where mm -hmm. school of humanities, social science, and the college of computing is the, is the pinnacle, and you know, just the, the I feel like we're the work we do is devalued all, all the time. And, and actually, I guess one um, clear measure of it is there isn't even anybody from the humanities or arts on the search committee for the new president. Oh, well, that is sad. Uh, hmm. So I, I will just say briefly that we have many of the same challenges at Stanford, mm -hmm. and that some of us inside the organization are fighting like crazy to make changes. 
and we'll see what happens. I have a question for Mary Beth. This is actually ripping off something that, that Fred sent me in an email um, saying that, you know, so one question to raise about this project is, you know, why we need to see the valley with our eyes, but implicitly to question about the power of still photography to make things visible um, and the power that movie images or even images databases, as you put it, um, makes it hard to focus on. And I'm wondering if you could talk a bit about the power of still. Now, you might say, well, their photography is the best thing, so I'm a photographer, and that's what you know, <laughs> right? But yeah. as opposed to making films about uh, this, mm -hmm. this kind of material, or as again, especially in movie image databases, or um, what makes photography a, 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 a smart tool to use for thinking through hmm. and exposing um, injustice and inequalities? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I'm not so sure it is always a smart tool. And I think that photographers have hid behind a notion of I'm going to make the better the world a better place by exposing this injustice since the beginning of photography. But really, photography can often make things worse by reinforcing the photographer's own subjectivity, certain stereotypes. I mean, photography has been a real agent of denigration since its inception um, of communities of people of color. I mean, I'm going to photograph this in a certain way. And then this work sort of justifies my own subjugation of the world. So, I mean, that's out there. And that in this moment, especially in the hands of a white photographer, I think um, is really important to, to be aware of and to, and to push against. I mean, Fred and I have, have wonderful disagreements, yeah, 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 big fights <laughs> about about all this. But I mean, so so I mean, photography is my me, the medium that I love because I love the encounter. I love this moment of making something aesthetic. I love there being this object that stays still that can be returned to over time. Um, and again, the, the, the installation work that I do is about these huge images being in a space that people do pass by over time and have noted to me that the image stays the same, but they change in relation to the image as they're thinking it through and imagining what are my own preconceptions about this person. And when I learn about that person, how does that shift and how do I come to um, become fond of this image and not want it to leave the cityscape? I think, I think a lot about... Um, uh, but, but, you know, the fact that I love to make photography is enough of a justification because of the damage that I think photography has done in the world. And so one scholar that I think a lot about is Sarah Elizabeth Lewis, who teaches at Harvard, who edited the vision and justice issue of Aperture in 2017. And, um, you know, is just a rock star at convening thinkers and artists and writers around these issues. And, she really believes in the power of the aesthetic encounter to move a person um, beyond the limits of what they're seeing now. And so if you stand in front of a work of art, you know, I don't know if you've ever had the experience of standing in front of Mark Rothko and bursting into tears. I have, you know, that there's something about standing in front of an image or, or experiencing something that's beautiful formally that can open you up in a way that's not exactly intellectual and it's not exactly literal but that's, that's something. So um, I'm not claiming that these pictures are Rothko-esque, but that I try to get a viewer to a place that's elevated from the daily because in the daily we're passing each other and we're passing each other and the light is bad and the pole is sticking out of your head and the uh, bars and I'm hungry and I can't and I'm stuck on what, you know, and, and so there's something about isolating this idea of a human being and, and presenting that in the most beautiful container I can create to try to, um, to, try to inspire a, 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 a contemplative act on the part of the world. I, 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 I mean, sure, well, we can well, record it. Well, we? <laughs> so it's right. Yeah, and I would yeah. say that my historical work, what I try to do is build literally like bowls into which people who don't have the time and the resources that I do to dig up the past can look and see the places that they come from. Like that's really what I'm trying to do in my work. And I, I get it wrong all the time. And Ray Beth and I are a little different about this. I was a journalist for a long time here in Boston, 10 years. And you know, I know that I get it wrong every time. I get that, that's like given, but I'm trying. I try a little more every time. 
And I'm okay with that. I'm okay with the fact that I will not see the whole thing. I will see it from my perspective. My perspective is historically conditioned. I just accept that. I reserve the right to look at people who are different than me and tell stories about them, but try to listen respectfully while I do that. And I reserve the right to be told I'm wrong. You know, that's, that's all good. Um, I'll say another thing, just which is, which is something that's a little peculiar about images. I love the way that two things. First, good foot photographs of what Bruno Latour calls immutable mobiles. They are, they, you know, huh? they are, I, I put it that a million uh, times in the great right? work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they're not, they're, they, are, they are mobile things that don't change. They, they reward looking at again and again and again. So that's one power. Another power, though, and this is where Mary Beth and I perhaps differ. I think photographs have a power to be both at hand. I think photographs taken for awful purposes can often reveal things that we don't expect. Yeah. And vice versa. For, for, for persons, photos taken for ostensibly benevolent reasons can, can hurt people enormously. My favorite work in this regard is by Joshua Gamson. He's a scholar of um, gay men and media. And he showed um, very persuasively that gay men were often brought on television talk shows in the early 70s to be made fun of, especially effeminate gay men. But that when they were brought on to shows to be made fun of, audiences reacted very differently, saw them in fact as human beings. And these make fun of settings were actually gateways to public participation um, for gay men in this period, it's pre-AIDS. Um, and I thought that's a very powerful argument and it's a very interesting argument. And he yes. makes it pretty persuasively over two books. So I, I think that we live in a world where our challenge is to see both and. The thing about this, I mean, I love film. You know, I wouldn't, I, you know, um, those seven up films and all of that mm -hmm. incredible work. I mean, I like to think that this is a tiny contribution, but right now we, we're going to talk about this in the next 24 hours, but I'm in a conversation with Stanford um, archives and library about acquiring this work to to be there for students a hundred years from now to be able to say, what was it like for a worker in the age of Zuckerberg? Mm -hmm. And so that really pleases me that long after I'm gone, there's a document that is in the form of a still image and, and these narratives that will that will exist. Have they talked about banners with you yet? Not yet. We're gonna talk about that. So they, yeah. they want to acquire photos as objects. That's what we need to talk about, it, whether it's objects or as digital, right? Because that's a whole There's other- There's an conversation also about whether we can hang banners of these images in the library for our students to do their work online. Because currently we have a display about Silicon Valley that's, a, as you might imagine, a celebration of heroic inventors of Fairchild semiconductors. And so we're, we're the only person of color in the entire display right now is the cover of our book. That's the only thing on the display right now in, in all of it. I haven't looked at the book, so this may be it. May it's coming been, around. Yeah, I know. I have mine. Uh, but so this may have been absolutely the scope of the remit of what you're thinking about. But I love the idea of the picturing of the mythos by thinking about bodies and materiality. I think that's lovely. The thing I'm, I'm also struck by and thinking about is uh, many of us have visited enough campuses, mm -hmm. tech campuses, tech campus. and, and certainly talk to them MIT students like that light. That light. Mm -hmm. Also, know that that's a visible place often side of them mm -hmm. as a knowledge worker. Mm -hmm. um, I'm mm -hmm. thinking of one, one place I visited that hung these kind of quasi umbrellas because of the fluorescent lights, mm -hmm. or the sleeping bag shoved a, a cubicle light. So I'm just curious if you've thought about, I mean, of course, a lot of people get paid a hell of a lot of money, but mm -hmm. no, no equivalence. Mm -hmm. But there is something materially embodied, quite miserable sometimes about that. Those campuses are going to Blessing it over with the dentist and the books. Yep. You know, yep. so I just I wondered if that if that was ever sort of what you I would love to photograph in there, but good luck. <laughs> it is well, maybe that's just fortress. Yeah, mm -hmm. right. I mean, fortress. I, so this is this was actually a, a real problem for us. Yeah. We we were aware of that. And I, I've often thought that undergraduate life at MIT is perfect training for that. <laughs> you know, part of what the undergraduate life at MIT is designed to do is to brutalize young folks yeah. so that they take those conditions. Yeah. But you know, yeah. you know, ha what's a hackathon? But you know, and that I didn't spend with my friends. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> the, 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 but but um, we were not. So I've gotten into tech firms, but only because I have friends who work there, and I've, I've gone in on a personal basis and then turned it into work. We were totally unable to get Mary Beth in there on any kind of formal photographing basis. I made a portrait of a, of a woman at Google, and it was, yeah, you're right. It was like not great in there. 
and went and she and she retracted it because when right. her higher ups found out that she let yeah. me in and yeah. Yeah. yeah especially if you love the value chain in their perception inside the firm the companies become very aware of, of reputation issues um, and you know very best work is is i think slated to be in our new computer science building i'm very excited about um, but we are unable to hang banners on the walls. Mary Beth makes these 40 by 40 foot banners and has done that in every other project. We're unable to do that at Stanford because the buildings are trademarked. Right. Yeah, we can't, we can't. The hang buildings there. themselves. The buildings themselves are trademarked and it would be a brand violation. Yeah. Just saying. So, but, but, that's, but that's exactly the visual regime work I was talking about earlier. You know, we're doing work to make sure that those are not people, but a brand violation. Like that's interesting. Well, I think we've, we've just hit with 628. So <laughs> thank you. So Did I answer your question? Here. Yes. Yeah, yeah, thank, okay. You. Okay. Thank, you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having thank us, Heather. This is what comparative media studies is for. <laughs>